Hey everybody, welcome to the Blender Report, where news meets rational thinking. I'm your host, Jonathan Harvey. This is your co-host, Liam DeBoer. Liam, what are we talking about today? Today, we're going to be chatting about the rebranding and unveiling of 15-minute cities in Winnipeg, Pierre Polyev arguing that government-funded media erodes free speech, RCMP arresting a Canadian citizen for discriminatory social media posts, Canada's federal debt being much worse than the federal government leads on, Trudeau's independent quote-unquote Senate adding two more loyal liberals, and RFK Jr. considering dropping out of the presidential race to join forces with Donald Trump. This podcast is brought to you by Higher Health's Organ Supplements, sourced from 100% grass-fed, grass-finished cattle raised by Canadian regenerative farmers. These supplements are designed to fill the nutrient gaps in our modern diets. Higher Health's, connecting people to real food. All right, let's get into it. So first off, we've got 15 Minute Cities 2.0, Opposition to Plan 2050, Growing Among Municipalities. A growing number of municipalities in the Winnipeg metro region are pushing back against the proposed Plan 2050, worried that it could strip power away from their locally elected councils. Plan 2050 is designed to guide how the region, including Winnipeg and 17 nearby municipalities, will grow over the next 25 years. However, some communities feel they were forced into the plan without proper input and fear it could lead to decisions being made by a centralized authority rather than by those who know their towns best. The situation is drawing comparisons to the controversy over 15-minute cities where the idea of planning for more walkable, self-contained communities sparked concerns about local autonomy. In both cases, the centralization of decision-making power and the potential loss of control for local governments are major sticking points. Other cities like Edmonton, Calgary, Vancouver, Toronto, Halifax, and Montreal have set up planning regions already. Public hearings on the plan have already drawn large crowds, showing just how heated the debate has become. As the province reviews the legislation that brought Plan 2050 to life, these municipalities are calling for a pause until more clarity and local input are guaranteed. So do these municipalities have enough weight to successfully push back against these attempts at planning their future for them? I mean, I guess they're really the only line of defense people have at this point, right? Because this is all from elected officials in a sense. We've seen the pushback from these groups, and I think that it's important to see uh, that they're kind of on our side with these issues. I think that's great. Uh, however, um, if, if they really want to get this done, they're going to find a way to get it done, right? So, so here, here's my big problem. This is 15 Minute Cities rebranded, right? And you're saying, okay, well, it's, it's Plan 2050, but it's only in Winnipeg. Here's the thing. It's, it's not only in Winnipeg. There's something called the Vancouver Plan. Same thing. 15 Minute City Alternative. Something called Montreal 2030 Strategy. Same thing. Calgary's Municipal Development Plan. Same thing. The Ottawa Official Plan. Same thing. Edmonton's city plan, not a super creative name, but it's fine. (laughs) Uh, Then Winnipeg's obviously got the 2050, and then Toronto's got Transform TO Initiative and the Greater Golden Horseshoe Growth Plan. All of these, if you look, fall under a 15-minute city alternative. All of them do the exact same thing. They basically recognized, hey, the branding's not going really well with this. Let's just scatter our names and slightly alter these plans and implement them this way. That's what's happening. We are under siege with this 15-minute city plan thing, and they're going to get it done. I don't know how it turns out, but they're on the attack. One of the things that many people will argue in favor of when it comes to these 15-minute cities is the convenience factor, right? And they'll argue how everybody should have access to uh, public transit and how it will make roads less congested. And yeah, it'd be Sound great like for the socialist. Be yeah. <laughs> it'd be great for the community if everybody could walk to the things they need. First of all, one thing many people don't consider is that four out of four or five months out of the year. Yeah. Think about how many people in Canada say 60 plus you're going to make them walk 10 to 15 minutes to the grocery store in, in minus 30, minus 40 degree weather. Be a good wake up call for those climate zealots. Though. Yeah. <laughs> That's how many dead people die in the cold, you idiots. And then also too, when has anybody ever expected giving somebody anything, even if it's not the government, a monopoly on services to improve the scenario of that service? So say, giving all transportation responsibilities to fulfill that demand to the government isn't going to respond by giving us a better 
transport sector. Our transit system is a mess yeah. already. I mean, the government's proven everything to put the hands on. Uh, they, they make a disaster. But here's the thing. 15-minute cities or a variation thereof gives the government too much control over what people can do. It will also lead to more surveillance, making neighborhoods, and in my opinion, kind of life in general, um, feel like Big Brother's constantly looking over your shoulder. I actually just saw that the federal government of Canada, federal government, is starting to put CCTV trackers around big cities like Calgary, Edmonton, Montreal, Toronto, and so on. And these have the capabilities to track people's license plate, facial recognition, and so on. And when you look at where they want to eventually go with these 15-minute cities, because again, these are all being done under the guise of climate change, right? Because climate change and convenience, that's how they're convincing everybody. It's one, it's it's both kind of this, because those are easy levers to pull. We've convinced you the world's burning to the ground, okay? Except like you said, six months out of the year, you can't even walk outside because it's so fucking cold. And then they're also going to say uh, the convenience factor. It'll be easier for everybody. So how long until they start trying to use that technology in order to implement some sort of carbon tracing? They're already talking about yeah. this kind of stuff. Short haul flights, like you said, one every couple of years. It's the no vehicles. It's the clothing. It's the meat. It's all this other. Look, when we say things like this, I think it's important to, 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 to understand that it's not just the 15 minute city, but it's all of the other things that they're doing around that that contribute to this sort of. I, for lack of a better term, sort of totalitarian control or authoritarian control. And it does have to do with the food and us having the biggest like, you know, insect plant in the world here in Ontario. It does have to do with the fact that they're like, hey, we are going to have carbon credits. Hey, you're not going to be able to travel. Hey, we want you to get rid of the vehicle. We don't want you to have that either. Hey, you can only get three items of clothing a year. They start saying and doing all these things. And then they implement a system that basically puts you in a cage like an animal. This is all work. This is all in conjunction together. That's why this is important to sort of push back. I think a fault that many people have when looking at this kind of thing is thinking that as soon as this starts to have negative consequences, because it will, if you go look at these non-motorized cities that have been attempted in the past, because again, these things have already been tried in places like Kalamazoo down in the States, as well as Buffalo downtown, and they failed miserably leading to uh, mass bankruptcy of businesses, nobody wanting to uh, open up any new businesses, because what ends up happening is there isn't an influx of people to come in and stimulate that economy. So for instance, even you take somewhere like Toronto, you look at how many people are going in and out of Toronto every day for work? Yeah. All of a sudden, if if you have these these regions and these these penalties to going across, well, yeah. now you're not going to have as much access to labor force. Right. And people will say, well, that's a good thing, but there's so many dominoes to fall here about, okay, so there isn't as many people in skilled labor or construction downtown Toronto to fill the demand for the jobs that are needed. So people need to come in from outside. But my whole point here is that when these policies start to have negative effects and those dominoes start falling, I think a lot of people give these central planners too much credit and think that, well, they'll admit that these these plans aren't good at that point and they'll turn around and start r- removing their their plans. Show me, show me when that happens. That never happens. That's right. Every single time that a government has this master plan as to how to save the world, this time in the case of climate change. When things start to go wrong, they always convince themselves that it's a lack of implementation that is causing their problems, and they actually just need more of their plans yes. to be implemented. They push and, the button yeah. harder. Yeah. That's exactly that's and that's exactly where we're going. It's like I don't know, man. I look at this country and I just I wonder how it repairs itself and what it looks like in twenty years, and who wants to even be around. I don't. You know what I mean? This is not the kind of shit that I'm going to stand for. And I imagine most people listening to us are like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to. Because here's what it ultimately is. You can, you can look at every aspect of a 15-minute city and you can be on one side of the argument. If I had to debate this and I can tell you what the convenience and how much better it's going to be and you're going to save money and you're going to be close to your friends and your family and blah, blah. You can do all that. There's going to be better opportunities for you. Blah, 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 blah. Ultimately, this removes individual freedom. So the entire argument goes out the window. If you are limited, if you like, we're already living in a fucking cage. If you are limited to a 15 minute city without having to pay penalties or fines or getting out and you can't find job opportunities or other things outside of that without it costing you more than it's, than it's worth, let's say you have no individual freedom. The game's over. 
And then they're only going to implement more tools from that point because how are they going to hold you to account? Well, surveillance, that's the only way. And then it's then, then you're then everything from that point on, it's like we're already dealing with censorship laws. You can't say the things you want without being ostracized or canceled or, or you know, removed from a social platform. This just gets worse. Censorship gets worse. All of this stuff gets significantly worse the more power you give these people. This needs to stop. I hope these municipalities can, can hold these people off, but I'm of the opinion that when a government has an idea, like you said, it doesn't work out the first time, they reframe it, they rebrand it, but they keep jamming it down your throat. This is going to work its way through. We're going to see this come to life. Moving on to our next story, we've got Polyev arguing that government-funded media is in direct conflict with free speech. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev criticized the state of local journalism in Canada, attributing its decline to the Liberal government's significant subsidies for legacy media. During an interview with The Lake Report, Polyev condemned the Local Journalism Initiative, or LJI, a government-funded program that pays journalists up to $60,000 annually to cover underserved communities. He argued that such subsidies compromise media independence and turn journalists into mouthpieces for the government. How do you feel about the state of journalism and free speech within our country? Uh, I think it's in real trouble. And I think there's a number of reasons why. Um, Obviously, the number number one reason is government subsidies. It's like, it starts significant government subsidies. How can you remain neutral when the only client you have in some cases is the government? It's, it's, it's impossible. Because here's the thing, even if you have a brilliant idea and you're a young, ambitious journalist, how many layers does it have to go through before it goes to the top or they go, not a chance? And here's the thing, you know, you and I will continue to fight and fight and fight. But if every day you get up and you get punched in the face, you don't even get on your feet. As soon as you can get out of there and go fight from some other angle or another position, that's what you're going to do. You're not going to stay there. So if these journalists go, well, I'm getting paid, I'm going to stay here. Every time I have an idea that's anti-government or anti-Trudeau or, or, or challenges the status quo, I get shut down. What am I going to do? I'm going to stop writing about these things. And the thing is, if I do leave, someone else will take my spot anyway. And I think that's how a lot of journalists see things in Canada right now. So government subsidies are significant, um, a significant part of the problem. Bill C-18, the Online News Act. Look, I, you can't charge these companies to pay your media companies in Canada because they suck shit. That's basically what this is, but that's what they're doing. And then, so so you get into this funny position where now you've got this significant fund, I'm using significant a lot, you've got this large fund of money, and then this, this, this government organization that's loosely tied to the government is deciding where this money goes. So you've already got mainstream media, now you've got this $100 million a year fund from Google that goes to all these smaller media outlets that have to be approved by this pseudo government agency. So now again, now you're controlling the highways and now you're controlling all the back streets with the information. And then if you don't, you can't get your media out anyway because Meta, you Facebook and Instagram, which are pretty significant tools for us, there it is again, uh, which, which, which are pretty important tools for us, you don't get any access to these things. Your, your accounts get shut down. We've lost 20,000 followers because of it. I know a lot of them have come back and I appreciate that, but you see what people are up against. I mean, I think media viewership's down 42% or something like that. On, in 42.6%. Yeah, 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 exactly. And this, and this is one of the reasons why. So this is damning for at least the media. Then you look at something like Bill C-11, the Online Streaming Act. People will argue that, well, it's to, it's to prioritize Canadian content. Look, here's the thing. If you are prioritize, if you're telling me what I have to prioritize, that means I'm removing something else, right? And ultimately, there's a government organization or, or a government just individual that decides what's appropriate and what's not. You and I are not appropriate. So we are being censored. I call it a soft form of censorship because they're not directly saying Jonathan and Liam can't talk. It's you need to put this indigenous and gay content. <laughs> you do, you, this is this is what's more. This is what has to be in the feed. So ultimately, well, we, if we, you've got if you've got a public square and everybody's trying to speak to the same degree and they have the same tools and some people have louder crowds, but then all you do and this is what the government is doing in this scenario is they're coming in and giving certain people that they like what they're saying a megaphone to drown out the people with the larger viewership. Exactly, exactly. Them. And I see it too. Like, like, look, even a video I put out yesterday uh, at 9,000 views in the first hour. I usually, like through COVID, if I put out a video and it got 10,000 views in an hour, it was going to get 250,000 views overall. That was kind of the metric. It stopped at 40,000. Just stifled. Absolutely crushed. I don't care. It's not a big deal. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. But that, that's the reality of what this looks like. Our reach has been diminished by 80%. So that, that's, that's the result of these types of things, right? Um, and Bill C-63 is working its way through. Bill C-63 is a hate speech bill, which is going to turn this country into an absolute, it's going to, the media landscape, the free speech landscape in this country will be in the most 
precarious position in history. And it'll be interesting because it'll be one of the worst in the West. It'll be just as bad or worse than the UK. It'll be insane if any version of Bill, Bill C-63 passes through. Um, and then you've got stuff like self-censorship. So you, you have this, you have these two arms of self-censorship. One is because of social ostracization, right? If you say or do these things or challenge these ideas or challenge the LGBT stuff or challenge climate or challenge whatever, you're out of the group. Challenge COVID, you're out of the group. You're out, it doesn't even matter if you're qualified to challenge it, you're out of the group. But then you have these other things where now you have institutional oppression, like what's happening with Jordan Peterson in the School of Psychologists. They're going, look, even though you weren't speaking in any capacity for the School of Psychologists, you need to go through a re-education camp. That is bananas. That is so insane. Um, I just think that, you know, the, the, in general, we lack any equality of media representation as well. So you kind of add all that stuff in together. You look at the free speech landscape, the media landscape in Canada, and you go, I don't know really what's left of it for anybody. I mean, you and I have been doing this for this, this, uh, Blender's been around for about a year now. It's not profitable. We're sitting here doing this every day, day in, day out. It is not profitable because we are constantly suppressed by all the tools the government has to shut us up. So no, I mean, it's, it's, in, a, it's in a terrible position and I think it's only gonna get worse. But you shared a good quote with me the other day, a good idea. Um, by Eric Weinstein, I think it was. Uh, Brett, 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 Weinstein. Brett Weinstein. And it was, if you're flowing down a river and you're headed towards a waterfall, say you're on Niagara Falls, you don't stop paddling away from it. The closer you get, the harder you paddle. So that's how I think you and I see this in terms of why we fight back. This country's getting close to going off the end of the cliff. It's almost, it's almost irreparable at this point. But you and I are going to continue fighting and continue fighting because the canoe's getting close to the edge. And if we don't paddle as hard as we can, it's just going to go off. And you and I still have some hope. So we do what we do. But we are working against a very strong current. Well, this is just goes to show the whole socialist mindset, especially when it comes to things like media, where, OK, we're going to again, socialists do not understand the economy at all. So we're, no. <laughs> we're going to take money from productive entities, whether it be Meta, Google, all this kind of stuff. We're going to take money from productive entities and give them to entities that don't have a valuable market to pull from. So again, they say right in their thing, right? That they the subsidies are to be used in order to... Uh, cover underserved communities. Well, what that means is that there's just not a demand for that community's media or events to be covered. Of course. Because if there was, if there was a large enough people interested in hearing what was going on in whatever community they're referencing, somebody would fill that gap for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Supply and demand, make your money. Capitalism, we, let's go. Exactly. So we're going to take money from productive entities that do give media that people do actually give their attention to. And we're going to then take that money and give it to unproductive entities. That's just a recipe for economic disaster. When you say it like that, it sounds pretty insane, doesn't it? Yeah. And one thing in terms of information and information dissemination is that when it comes to media, often what they don't tell you or what they don't talk about is more important than what they do. And so you look at this and you go, okay, we're giving all of this, we're building a media apparatus that focuses on the little stuff in these little communities and blah, blah, blah. But then nobody is actually holding the massive machinery of government to account. They're not focusing on the, on the big deal stuff because they're making sure that everybody's resources and time is focused on the smaller independent stuff. Yeah, I mean, for me, when you think about it, I kind of go back to what I was saying with the highways and the back roads. Like, the, 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 the reality here is they've implemented a set of tools that give them complete control of the media. And the media in Canada is for, I don't want to say all intents and purposes, but I want to say like 90% is essentially nationalized, right? And it's not just your mainstream you know, you want to look at right wing, we have the National Post. And you got like the Sun. Well, I like the Sun. It's brand equity is kind of framed it as more of a tablet. So really, you have the National Post. And they are still partially subsidized by the government. So mainstream, captured. They implement these tools. And now everything below it is now captured. It's basically all just a government megaphone. It's just a government tool. Polyev does say that government funding for media is in direct opposition to free speech. 
That's his, that's his, his ideology around this. That's what he believes. That's what everyone should believe. You and I believe the same thing. It is the only thing that makes sense is just, hey, if you can survive, survive. Everybody wants to get the information. And like you said, there's a big market for it. Everybody wants to hear it. So it shouldn't just be the only ones that survive are government organizations, government funded organizations. Because here's the thing, media companies will adapt. Everyone will adapt. Everything will change. People will find a way to make this work because there is money here. Anyway, my hope is, and what I'm getting to is, I'm hopeful that Pierre Polyev gets in and he sticks true to his word and he does dismantle this mess and he does cut government funding and he does allow a bunch of these organizations to fail and thousands of people to lose their jobs that were doing exactly what I said earlier, just towing the line because they have to. And then maybe we can rebuild the media landscape in this country. That being said, when you change leadership, the cogs in the machine will take a lot longer. So I still think it's three to five years before we see any daylight. Hey everyone, we hope you're enjoying this episode. If so, please consider leaving us a kind review wherever you're listening. If even just a quarter of our weekly audience did so, we'd instantly become one of the top rated Canadian podcasts. We appreciate you helping us out. And now back to the show. Well, off on to the other side of this conversation, the free speech side, unless the media side, we're moving on to our next topic here, which is our CMP arrests social media user over discriminatory and racially offensive posts. The RCMP recently arrested a woman in connection with discriminatory and harmful language she allegedly posted on X or formerly Twitter, specifically targeting the South Asian community. In response, the RCMP collaborated with the BC Hate Crimes Unit and received assistance from the public to identify the account user responsible for the posts. The woman was arrested on August 7th, though police have not released her name or other identifying details. So should there be legal consequences for situations like this online? Um, look, I have like basically one rule. I have two, let's say two. Don't actually incite violence. Don't give me the nonsense version. I genuinely mean violence. Like AKA, we need to go kill this person. I'm going to kill this person, X, Y, that, that realm. I understand that being a problem. That needs to be dealt with accordingly. I think you live online as you live offline. You say that to somebody, that's a real problem and you shouldn't be able to do that. The only other thing I would say, I have a bit of an issue with doxing people, which is like sharing their personal information, their address, stuff like that. Um, that's, a bit of a, that's a bit of a qualm for me. Otherwise, free speech absolutist. That's kind of how I see things. Like I a, don't know what this person said and I'm sure it was inappropriate and shitty and I, I guarantee I don't agree with it. Guaranteed. But I agree with her right to say it. Well, you know, it's funny because you can sit there and say, yeah, I don't agree with what this person said. But again, we'll just see a two tier version of implementing these things. 100%. So if white people say something bad, then, you know, the whole book will get thrown at them if they if they say something about a somebody that's non white. But if somebody says anything about white people, it will be completely fine. It'll be applauded. There, there, dude, there was uh, the Huffington Post editor, which is a oh, God. brutal, uh, brutal media outlet. But anyways, she, I think it was like in 2019 or 2020 or something, she posted that her New Year's resolution was a two-step plan, which was one, to band together with all women, and then two, to kill all white men. And... No issue. No major backlash. That woman ended up still being the CEO for a long time. But anyways, you can see in that scenario where as long as the uh, as long as the threats are made against the so-called oppressor group, yes, then anything goes, anything goes. I would actually I would go one step further. No, I mean not further, I'd go one step laterally even and say, uh, there'll be a liberal set of rules and a conservative set of rules, yeah. i.e. Democratic, Republican, same thing. Um, that's because that's how it's already working out. So it's like if you buy into, for example, climate change stuff, uh, the LGBT stuff, challenging any of that parental rights stuff, challenge it, it's going to be pulled down. You're going to be a problem. For sure. If you don't, if you're for it, mutilating children, which, which is insane. You know what? I'm going to touch on that for a quick moment. Um, all through Europe, the UK, all these places, they've done this child mutilation stuff for several years and go, oh my God, what have we done? We need to stop immediately. They're not doing it anymore. All these companies like the JIDS clinic, they're, they're basic. Those people are going to be buried forever. You know what I mean? They've stopped doing the hormone blockers, all this stuff, because it's very, very harmful, very harmful. And we have clear evidence that it's very harmful and ineffective. And that actual suicide rates are highest seven years after transition. Just so everybody's clear. That was a large study as well. There's been multiple studies done on this. This is not good for kids. This is, this is horrible. 
but in the United States and Canada, more so even in Canada, pr pretty much the easiest place to get her done, um, we're still open to it. And you are a problem if you push back against it. I cannot stand these people. Well, to show we can look to the UK to see what might be in store for us, especially if things like Bill C-63 go along, but it looks like there's already some legal framework here for them to pull people in over this kind of stuff after, you know, issuing this, this arrest of this, this woman in, uh, in out West here. But so in the UK, a, uh, woman was jailed for two years for stickers that had phrases saying it's okay to be white, uh, reject white guilt and they seek conquest, not asylum. So the judge Tom Bayless in this case said the publication of this kind of material is corrosive to our society and told Malia that I am quite sure that your mindset is that of a racist and white supremacist. So yeah, saying it's okay to be white is now prison, a prison offense in the UK. Well, even, even take the worst one there. They're, they're here for conquest, not asylum. Even take the worst one. Yeah. They're here for conquest, not asylum. That's not jail time. No, there's nothing about that. That's jail time. What are we doing? And then, so showing the hypocrisy of these things, this same judge that sentenced this woman to two years in prison for harmless stickers, uh, also let a man go. How do I say this without getting us censored for, uh, child in bestiality, bestiality, content, let's say, uh, stating, I don't pretend for one moment to know what possesses someone like you to get pleasure from watching children as young as three or six or seven being raped uh, because that is what you are watching. So on one hand, this person just gets off with a slap on the wrist and on the other hand goes to jail for two years. The judicial system is completely compromised too. Mm -hmm. Like they say, well, it's not political. Of course it is. They're, they're pulling, all they're doing is towing the political line across the board. These people are appointed. They're looking at Trudeau going, you need to appoint more judges. I'm surprised he's not actually. That's one thing I'm kind of like, I wonder why he's not putting more of these people, these, his minions in place here. I've had some bad experiences with it myself. This, the, the judicial, pardon me, the judicial system here is just as big a mess, just as compromised. At least in the, it is in the States too. Let's be realistic. I mean, at least in the States, they wear their colors. So you kind of know what you're getting into, which I don't agree with either, but it just shows you this whole thing is partisan. It's insane. And the same shit's going to happen here. It's already happening. It's just, <sighs> well, again, to put it into perspective, Judge Benedict Keller sentenced a man to 18 months in prison in the UK for chanting, who the fuck is Allah? and gave someone a lighter sentence that assaulted a police officer. So s s blasphemy, essentially. Yeah. Islamic Sharia law is now, blasphemy laws are now being enacted. You can't slander their God. But, you know, physically assault a police officer, that's, uh, that's a less of a sentencing. There was also another judge in the UK, John Temperley, who gave a man 12 weeks in prison for a Facebook post deemed racist, yet did not give any prison time to a man with 46 indecent images of children. So again, like just look at the insanity here. This is not one isolated case. This is three, four. The, again, there's a thread here that I've got, which goes on for time of these exact judges that are obviously, you know, the actual root word of the, the justice means fairness. It means just, e yeah, yeah, it means equality of sorts. And then, so just to see them under the name of justice, do the exact opposite. This goes to the whole double speak Orwellian thing of uh, when a totalitarian, when a society goes totalitarian, it has to thrive on holding two contradictory beliefs at the same time. So again, justice is hypocrisy, right? I think it's important to note that when your justice system falls, society is compromised and it may be beyond repair. Mm -hmm. if, because you need a group of trustworthy individuals in those positions to be able to continue to steer the ship and correct course. This is the why they, they, they are the people, they, they stop governments from over, from, from, they stop governments from passing policy that are egregious. They stop people, you know, with children and all these other things and attacking police officers and all this other stuff. 
th th their job is to to maintain order within society in in a just way, right? Um, when they are compromised uh, politically, and it all, it's all become about ideology and agenda, your country's gone. What what you know of your it, it's it's burned to the ground because there's nothing else. That is the last line of defense. Let's put it that way. When that's compromised, the Trojan horse is in. It's behind the gates. You're fucked. So I don't know. For me, I see this kind of stuff and I go, regular people have no power. We're done. That's what it makes me feel like. Yeah. Well, you know, going back to something you said earlier, right? The closer you get to that waterfall, the harder you start paddling. So yeah. again, it doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense at any point to give up on that paddle. So I, it, unless you're on the way down. Even then, fucking go upstream, buddy. <laughs> I'm going to die with some dignity. It's not even that I don't want to die with dignity. That's not what I'm saying. And I'm not really saying, think about it this way. You're saying you want to die with dignity and I'm saying live to fight another day. So it, it, it's not about giving up. It's about when it gets to the point that it's gone over the edge, what do you do? You're like, oh, I'll paddle upstream. Science says you won't. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what I mean is at what point do you step out and go, Okay, I'm going to hang on to this rock. The boat's going to go over. I'm going to wait for things to calm down. I'm going to swim back upstream. I'm going to get this. I'm going to figure this out. And that's what I'm, I, I don't think we're there yet, but the judicial system is a good signpost because if this is what's happening in the UK, think about it this way. If this is how things operate in the UK, what they do is, I said, they steer society with what's right and wrong. And now if blasphemy against Allah is, is, is now wrong because you go to jail for two years, you now have self-censorship. You are steering society. You are creating two tiered. You are creating a two tiered justice system. This, when this happens, right? How far down the line does it have to go? Because look, if Bill C sixty three goes through, how 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 long do you think you and I last? Not long. But here, and right. I can't make a decision for anybody else. Do what you think is best. Um, I think if somebody is in a differing scenario, like let's say they they have kids that they have to. Uh, provide for and such. I, I can understand why somebody would take a dis different decision than me, but I've already made this decision. I made it months, if not a year or two ago, that there won't be anything that can be put in place to take away my tongue. That's like that. That is my biggest fuck you. That's the only power I really have. Except left. you've already been cut off of TikTok. We've already lost an account on Instagram for starters. Um, we get videos demonetized on YouTube. Uh, our reach is, our, our reach has been snuffed out on Instagram again. Um, you're going to go to the town square because if you say this stuff in public, you'll get thrown in jail. So you're going to yell from the cell. Like what's your game plan? No, you go full Steve Rogers in the alley out back of the movie theater yeah. before he's got the super <laughs> serum and has zero chance for standing up for himself, but he still sits there and looks at the guy in the face and says, I can do this all day. I, I think that there, I agree. I think, I think there's a, I feel like there is a, a path to follow. That, like I said, gives you an opportunity to fight another day. I don't know what that looks like, but I think sometimes you should have maybe the, the wherewithal to realize that this is not just about being a, yeah, I don't, and I don't think you're a martyr, but I mean, it's not about putting yourself in that position because then what can you accomplish? What can you do for the people? Like, so let's say this, let's say that you and I get to a point that our voice is significant. Like it becomes one of the most, one of the, one of the most important voices in Canada as things continue to get worse and worse and worse, right? Let's say that you and I are rallying 10, 20, 30, 100,000 people every time we put out a podcast, every time we have break news on something important. Let, let, let's just say that's our reality. So you and I are moving the needle in a, in, a, in a pretty important way, right? Now, if we're at a time when we need to be able to push back because, I don't know, Trudeau's implemented some UBI and some other things, and it looks like he's going to get reelected and Canada's going to go off the cliff, right? Is it your opinion that you would stay here and fight, even if it meant, hey, maybe you're going to go to jail and lose your voice for a set amount of time um, because that, that's your moral ground to stand on? But now those 100,000 people that depended on you or a million or whatever it is, they don't have your voice anymore. Or would you say, okay, guys, let's get in the car. Let's drive to Mexico. We will continue talking. No one will stop us. We will keep pushing back. But we're going to have to do it from over there because we're, we're kind of untouchable in that location. So my, I'm of the opinion, get in the car and drive to Mexico live to fight another day. It's not about not fighting. It's about putting yourself in a position where you can still cause damage. Now I'm an archer instead of fighting with the sword, but you want to stay here and what? Cut your own throat? <laughs> <laughs> if I can get myself out of here and go live a better life somewhere else, then I don't owe Canada my own suffering. Okay, well, that's my point though. Okay, so that's what, what I'm saying. I, what I am saying is we're seeing this happen on a global stage and the 
whether there will be places that you can go. Who knows? Why Maybe I literally picked not. Mexico because it's run by the cartel because that seems safer these days, <laughs> which is <It's> insane. wild. <laughs> but if that's the scenario, okay, I I know where this path leads through historical references, and the social pressures only become larger and larger. The consequences only become greater yes. for speaking out. And so I think this is, this is something that's fundamental about my worldview that differs from a lot of people. I think there is scenarios worse than death. I think living in hell is worse than death. I would rather die at the beginning of a socialist or communist revolution for essentially staying myself, being principled, not betraying my conscience yeah. than to live 40, 50 years in a gulag under forced labor or f- be worried about that. I'm even going to have the wrong thoughts. Oh, that no, could no. Get me put I, in I, I, I agree with you. So like that, that yeah. to me, this is, th- th- this is the scenario. Are you, are you going to, you know, John snow it as a horde of uh, knights charges towards you, but you say, fuck it, I'm going to take my sword out and, go out on go out with my uh with my, on my own terms on my own terms sure or am i going to like become into like some creature like golem hiding in a cave no 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 like- so, so so i think i think maybe we're just we're talking about different things i'm not saying stop if there's no other option if there's nowhere to go and there's no other option and it's either the gulag 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 it's either that it's either the gulag or or you fight to the death yeah, let's go. I already told you, I'll William Wallace that shit. Yeah, I, yeah. I will rally people. <laughs> there will be a fight. I have no problem with that. What I'm saying though is, it's not really the world we live in and there are places to go. And it, I do appreciate your historical references, but we live at a time where more doors are open to seek solace other places. They just, they just are. And it never used to be like that. Or it, it's not been like that for, for a long time. So when you look at historical references that are you know, even, um, even, even 100 years old, or, or a little less, like even like World War II, like that era, you really didn't have the same opportunity to get up and move around and reposition yourself and then use these tools to still affect change. That wasn't an option, but it is now. So we're actually not going to get to a point. I don't think we're going to get to a point in our lifetime, unless the aliens show up or some shit, where it really is like a global totalitarian rule. There's always going to be places for people like us because the people that are running the world grew up with independence and it's going to continue on. And I know it gets tighter and tighter, but people like us will always have another place to go. We're not going to be, it's not going to be do or die. That's not going to happen. I just don't believe so anyway. Maybe. I mean, I I think you and I are in different scenarios as well. I don't have as much hope that I have the ability to get out of Canada if things do go that way. I'll be gone in 15 minutes. Yeah. See, you you say that. I I look at that and I go, I don't know how I make it work. I know people everywhere. I'm gone. I'll be be gone so fast. So you and I are in different scenarios in that that position. (laughs) So yeah, that that did that changes our the way that we approach it a lot more. And two, I look at that. Let's say, and this is probably a very small number of people, but let's I've even seen it within family or friends that have seen that I've spoken up, and they have now admitted to me that they have more cor- courage to stand up, even if it's not not necessarily going out on social media or starting this whole thing. But sure. They've said to me that, oh, if I'm in a circle with a couple friends and they're saying something I disagree with, I actually like I feel okay now better to just sit there and say I disagree with that. Right. And so that to me, if I can have that influence on people that they feel like they have more of a leg to stand on and they don't have to give in to groupthink and social pressure, then to me, if I take away, if I stop talking than every single one of those people does too. Right, and so that, and I think we're kind of landing in the same place. I think we can agree that we're not going to see gulags in Canada for some time. It's not going to happen. Um, not for us, re- really. What we're going to see is suppression and legal, le- basically um, suppression and the justice system thrown at us. That's about as much as we're going to see, really. Um, but we are of the same opinion that we're better off finding a place. When that canoe goes over the edge, you and I are better off jumping out finding a rock, waiting for it to calm down, swimming to the fucking side and going to a place where we can continue doing this because the significance, it, it's more its more important to keep the fight going than to die on a hill before it's actually necessary. That's kind of where I'm getting. Yeah, maybe. I don't <laughs> know, maybe. <laughs> All right, uh, our next story, we've got a study finding that Canada's debt crisis is much worse than the government lets on. The Fraser Institute's recent study highlights how Canada's debt crisis is much worse than what the Liberal government presents. 
The government often highlights that Canada has the lowest net debt to GDP ratio among G7 nations, but the study shows how this statistic is misleading because it includes financial assets that aren't available to pay down debt. Without subtracting these unusable assets, Canada's ranking plummets to 26th out of 32 countries and third lowest in the G7, trailing the UK and Germany. This drop of 21 places is the largest change among the 32 countries analyzed. The report explains that gross debt provides a more accurate comparison with other countries because it doesn't offset debt with assets that can't actually be used to reduce liabilities. Specifically, the net assets in the CPP and QPP, which amount to approximately $716.7 billion, make up the more than a quarter of the $2.7 trillion difference between Canada's gross and net debt. So what this all means here is that the Liberal government is using the assets that they aren't actually able to put towards debt payments in order to make it seem like their liability or their exposure is less than it really is. This big gap highlights that the federal government is using net debt to hide how bad Canada's financial situation really is compared to other countries. So is this a dire situation for Canada? Yeah, I mean, look, I think national debt should always be taken with a grain of salt. You can have significant national debt. That is the word of the day. You can have you can have, yeah, it is what it is. You can have significant national debt, um, but if you've got a productive economy and you have opportunity, it definitely weighs on you, especially, you know, if you have to service debt. Canada's debt servicing cost is $45 billion a year now. It's closing in on 10% of our, of our federal budget, which is pretty large. Um, you know, the U.S. has got a big problem there too, but there's more, they have way more productivity. The problem you actually have with the national debt when you look at it is how did we get here and how are we getting out of here, Right. So the real problem we have is that we are, we're one of the most heavily indebted countries, sure, but we have no innovation, no industry, no growth, um, and we have no productivity. And so they're like, oh, we'll give you lower interest rates, but, but that won't help in the big picture. It's just not going to do anything. We need, we need to actually change how our economy operates and what kind of opportunities we can provide within this country if we actually want things to get any better. So, you know, the, the reality is this. Big national debt does have some windfall effects, especially when it comes to us covering the cost of the debt at 45 billion a year. So that's, that, that's very real. Um, but the bigger problems are that we're not giving Canadians the tools they need for them to actually put themselves in a better position or for us to dig ourselves out of the debt. So again, the debt itself is not really that big a problem. All these countries have these debts. It's unfortunate that we're here. We really shouldn't be. Um, but if we were productive and had opportunity, it wouldn't really matter that much, right? So the bigger issues we have is we're not doing anything else. Uh, pardon me. The bigger issue we have is not we're not doing anything to improve our situation um, and to improve opportunity for Canadians and to make our lives any better. I think it's a little bit bigger of an issue than I guess maybe you do. Maybe we dif- disagree on here a little bit. But federal debt spending and spending, especially in economic downturns. Spending versus debt is different. How so? Well, because we're talking about a number that is currently debt. We're talking about just a fixed yeah. number. I don't have a problem so much with the debt. The federal spending, I have a huge issue with. But the fact that we have- But you only get debt through sure, deficit spend, spending. But, right, right. But I understand that. But I understand that. But I want to make the, the, the designation here is not, uh, do I have a problem with, with government spending? Yeah, that's one of our biggest problems, in fact. In fact, if we don't repair that very quickly, it's almost doubled under Trudeau, nearly doubled at this point under Trudeau. This is a huge problem. So yes, government spending is a big issue. But if you just look at debt alone, no, the, the, the debt of 1.26 trillion or 1.236 trillion, I think is what it is now. That's actually not a huge problem if you have a productive, a productive uh, economy. Government spending is a different thing. So it, those are two different, for, for me, those are two different topics because you, let's say our national debt's 1.236 million, right? But Paul Yev is in and he's breaking even, he's square. You're not really worried about government spending anymore. That's not really part of the conversation, but the debt still exists until we can chew it up. So my approach to that was just the debt, not the government spending. Sorry, but go on. I just don't think we're opposed, but anyway. So one of the things that this, this comes from a Keynesian school of economics, which believes that during economic downturns, government spending should be, essentially the government should make more money through printing to stimulate the economy and push that towards consumers. It's like, is 
think of it as if your economic engine is dying, you start throwing a little bit more fuel into the pistons to make them fire a little bit harder. Anyways, the this this theory has just not worked out. And this has been about a theory for hundred years. People got re- started getting away from it, realizing it doesn't work about 50 to 25 years ago. It, there started to be major holes poked through this economic theory because all you're doing in that scenario is creating more inflation or taxes for the future. You're borrowing now at a interest cost in the future. And that's what all deficit spending is. It's spending money you don't currently have. It's the exact same as when a personal, like you can understand in a personal situation where if somebody say, loses a paycheck for that month and they really need to hold themselves over on a credit card. But like that should be in the most dire situation. But what the government is doing is using the credit card as a sustained function to say, we're going to continue for years on end to spend on this credit card with money that we're not earning. Like that is inevitably going to lead to a major problem, which we are now facing, which it seems to be an inter insurmountable federal tax deficit at this point. And Milton Friedman actually pointed out this, just the, the, how everybody should keep an eye on government spending. As I said before, keep your eye on one thing and one thing only, how much government is spending, because that's the true tax. Every budget is balanced. There is no such thing as an unbalanced federal budget. You're paying for it. If you're not paying for it through it in the, in the form of explicit taxes, you're paying for it indirectly in the form of inflation or in the form of borrowing. And the thing you should keep your eye on is what government spends. And the real problem is to hold down government spending as a fraction of our income. And if you do that, you can stop worrying about the debt. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we're, we're, we're aligned. Like, Government spending is the biggest issue, and that's how we got here, because they spent trillions more dollars than we've already given them in tax, in, in tax payments. You know what I mean? So, so totally aligned. My, my perspective is $1.236 trillion for the nation of Canada, if that's the debt they have, and there's a, a ton of opportunity, and there's obviously more intelligent governments, like, it, it, you, you can turn this around. The debt itself isn't the end of Canada. You know what I mean? The United States is at a point, I don't know how they get out of that mess. I don't think they can. They're what, 34 trillion now? <laughs> it's crazy. So, so, so even if you go, even if they're not quite, they're really only, they're really only eight X our population at this point. Eight, eight and a half, right? So if you eight and a half X are 1.2 trillion, you know, you get, you're still under 10 trillion. So by comparison, they're three and a half times worse than we are per capita. That is, that is an unmanageable situation. I don't think that we are in an unmanageable situation right now. It's terrible and we shouldn't be here, but if you provide opportunity, we can get out of this mess. That's what I'm kind of saying with the debt. But yes, obviously, you, you, you need to, in, in addition to opportunity, I agree with you, you need to curb government spending significantly. Damn, you need to curb government spending more than any other expense probably in this country, right? So we're on the same page. Think about how different the world would be if the government didn't have control over money because any situation where they wanted to increase spending to a great degree, let's say for a war or for a natural infrastructure bill or something of that nature, they would have to immediately upon starting that process of starting a war or building new infrastructure, they would say, we have to, starting today. Yeah put new taxes in place to fund this project. But what having control over the central bank allows the government to do is say, we are going to print money in order to fund this project, which they always do. And that's how the citizens end up getting fucked by inflation years later. And so it's it's really interesting when you think that how different society would be if the government had to pitch everything with a... Like every shiny good that they try to put in front of your face, if they had an immediate price tag with that when trying to sell you it, it would change the entire landscape of our society. Yeah. And I mean, I appreciate what Polyev wants to do. He's like, if you want to spend this money, you got to save it somewhere else. We're not, we're not, we're not expanding government spending. And I think they've even, I think it was the tax federation, I'm not sure what maybe tax federation. Anyway, 
one organization that's not not connected with, but they oppose government. They sort of hold them to account. They're like, uh, we need Cretchen era government cuts here, like tax cuts. You, you need to you need to wipe up 15, 20% of the government. Just the public service has got to be cut down. This is ridiculous where we are right now. So I hope to see these things come to life. Um, I think it will make a big difference. But again, I kind of I kind of I kind of stand on the same ground I was on. If you provide opportunities for Canadians, I don't think our national debt um, is a death sentence at this point. All right, moving on to our next story. We've got Trudeau's independent Senate adds two more loyal liberals. Despite Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's promises of an independent Senate, his recent appointment of Tracy Mugley and Charles Adler highlights the continued partisan influence. When veteran broadcaster Charles Adler was appointed to the Canadian Senate, it unleashed a wave of mixed reactions, cheers from some and fierce criticism from others. The loudest voices accused him of being a liberal and a hypocrite, pointing to his past critiques of conservatives, anti-vaxxers, and even the Senate itself. Mugley, a longtime liberal supporter, social worker, and healthcare executive, has donated over $18,000 to the Liberal Party between 2006 and 2020 and ran as a liberal candidate in two federal elections. Her appointment, recommended by a supposedly independent advisory board known for its ties to the liberals, adds to the growing list of senators with deep liberal connections. So what would be a solution to the problems with the Canadian Senate? Uh, It's wild now. It's about 80% liberal. eh? It's pretty insane. And I like how Trudeau just removed a couple people from the Senate originally to be nonpartisan. And now it's been, as soon as you do your research, you're like, oh, every, like this is, this is just blatant at this point. Yeah. You donated to the party for 14 years and ran twice. No, no connection. Not even a loose one. Not concerned. What do you mean? That's wild. Um, Look, I think it's a pretty easy solution. I think that we should have elections in 2027, so they would be midterm elections. Uh, And I think this way, Canadians have the opportunity to sort of gauge the incoming government's actions, whether it be liberals or conservatives, so they can sort of um, vote accordingly. I think you need that two-year gap to originally, to to sort of initially do this, I mean. Um, But then that's it. Senators are always elected. You can't give these people that much power if they're appointed. That's the end of that conversation. That is it. That is not democratic. That's it. If they're, a, if they're a governing body that can stop legislation and policy from going through, they must be elected. This is insane that we allow this. People go, well, they're just figureheads. They don't really, no, they're not figureheads. They can stop things dead in their tracks. In fact, we've depended on them multiple times with, these, with, with crazy policy that's been pushed through by Trudeau. Luckily, they've been there once or twice for us over the last 10 years. This is an important group of people. They need to be elected. This needs, this appointment shit, this needs to end. This way you stop the partisanship in that sense. Or at least you allow the people to choose what they want, which is really what a democracy should be. Um, obviously, term limits as well, and not just age limits. So we have a 75-year-old age limit, term limits as well. I don't know what a suitable term limit is. I don't know if it's 10, 15 years. I'm not sure, but those need to be implemented. Well, yeah, to fix this problem, we need to overhaul our constitution, which, uh, you know, this has been a problem since before even Trudeau. You know, he ran saying that he was going to reform the Senate. Obviously, yeah, he hasn't done anything close to that, except just reformed it with his own loyalists. Hundred percent. But, but yeah. So this was something he shit on the conservatives about was the was the Senate. But you've seen that the Supreme Court will probably strike down any plan to overhaul. Well, this. they did it already to Harper, yeah. right? Which is what we're kind of in this mess anyway. Yeah. So, so we need to change our constitution, and I think that there is many things in the Canadian constitution we should be willing to change. Even the very opening sentence or paragraph yeah. of the thing says that the entire country of Canada exists to serve the British empire. And I look at that and go, okay, if the British empire was still the biggest on the block, so to say, and had actual, there was actual benefit of aligning yourself with that empire, you could argue that, that, that maybe that, that would be best than, say, a fully autonomous or sovereign Canada. But when you now look at the state of Britain and you go, there's no political or geopolitical benefit nothing. to Resources, serving nothing. Britain. Nope. Like, why, why is this still part of our constitution? Like, I think at this point, Canada should say, obviously, the British Empire no longer exists. And why are we serving a dead empire instead of... Now, I think, is the time to uh, actually embrace a sovereign and autonomous Canada. And this is something I was thinking about as well, is the whole world is about to go through 
population change shock, right? With aging populations, especially across the Western world. But even it's a thing in Russia, it's a thing in China. Japan is pretty much going to become non-existent in a few decades at the current rate. In that world where globalization becomes extremely fragmented, because what we live in now is a world where countries that can't sustain sustain themselves, say, through agriculture, they don't have enough economic output or even just the geographical ability to be able to feed themselves. Well, historically, that just meant those people there were fucked. But now what the what a globalized wor- world allows them to do is say, hey, we have a lot of raw resources. Let's say in Africa, we've got cobalt or lithium or whatever is needed. We can now become a net exporter of this, which allows us to then buy and import the agriculture we need. So when the population collapses, globalization is going to collapse alongside it. But Canada is actually in a very unique position alongside actually America, where we can sustain ourselves if we choose to. So we've got enough natural resources energy-wise to keep the lights on in Canada. We don't have to rely on anyone else for that. And then from an agricultural standpoint as well, which those are the two main important industries for any country is agriculture and energy. And we've got the ability on the egg front to keep the entire population of Canada fed. We are actually a net exporter. So The whole point that I'm trying to make here is that when it comes to even just the Senate stuff, I feel like there is this very big aversion to the idea of correcting or changing our constitution, right? Like people are just immediately, you recommend changing our constitution. People are immediately kind of put off about it. Right. But in a changing world where the entire dynamics of the world economy are going to shift, I don't see any scenario where it doesn't make sense to radically reform the country and say, okay, this is a new world we're about to enter. What makes sense for us as a nation to make sure that we can actually handle these changes? Yeah, I I totally agree. But here's the thing. Who gets to make those decisions? Mm -hmm. Because what we've seen really, and I'll go both sides, hyper-partisanship. We've seen no real balance. So if if you're really thinking, so I've said this frequently, if you're all one party, you're not a free thinker. There's good ideas on both sides. And there, there really are, because I do believe in some social programs. Now, maybe, maybe the conservatives are doing enough today that you could just buy into that party. But I mean, in general, especially in the States, striking dichotomy, complete opposites, right? So yes, we need to implement something that suits the world we live in and where things are going and the declining population and worry about you know globalism and all these things. But um, given how our society works together or, or does not work together, um, who would you possibly trust to implement that? Because I'm of the mind that you're right, but what you would have is you'd have the liberals come in and rebuild the constitution and the conservatives would come in and rebuild the constitution and blah, 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 blah. You won't actually get one good set of guidelines because people are unwilling to be pragmatic and logical. They're only willing to be partisan because that's where the power is. So you run into this problem where people of today, the system of today can't actually fix these things effectively. I think, and this isn't something that I want or that I'm calling for, but I just think that given the current trajectory we are on, the country will fragment at some point in the next couple decades. There will be a genuine pushback if things could, if things continue on the current path that they are on. Yeah, um, I am totally willing to admit that those things could naturally change. But in that scenario, I think you would have a something resembling, say, yeah, a couple decades down the line, something resembling a civil war. And in that scenario, whoever wins is rewriting the constitution. So yeah, I don't, again, I don't think that this is going to be something where the liberals and conservatives can sit down and uh, hammer out the details and say compromise with one another on, on that. But I think that it is just just with the way that we're on because basically is, you're saying the new world order comes off the back of a civil war. Yeah, I agree with you. I totally agree with you. That's where a lot of these things came from. That makes sense. Or just as say somebody tries to take us into the new world order in say a one world government, Trudeau has said before that he thinks Canada could become the first transnational state, which would mean to cede sovereignty to international bodies such as NATO, the UN, WHO, and so on. And he said that all the way back in 2017 to the New York Times. 
as that starts falling, because that's not going to work, as the country starts disintegrating at that point, if let's say he won another election and starts putting all of this stuff through, I just think that that would naturally come around where something, where the country just completely falls. And out of the, that, out of those ashes, the a new constitution or a new vision for Canada would arise. Yeah. Just like whether it be the Soviet, how the Soviet Union fell in the 1990s no, and all of a sudden they came, there was a vast overhaul. Yep. Whether any of the Eastern European countries that their regimes fell after that, there was a fundamental change in the way that they approached the future. And so... Again, I think that there is more than enough stuff we need to change in our constitution, but yeah, whether that will happen under the current circumstances, I, I doubt it. We're aligned. I feel the same way. I think that I think that that wraps it up nicely. Yeah. All right, and our last story for the day, we've got RFK Jr. considers dropping out to join forces with Trump. Nicole Shanahan, Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s running mate, revealed that their campaign is at a crossroads, either continue their presidential run, risking that they might inadvertently boost Kamala Harris's chances of winning, or withdraw and team up with Donald Trump. This candid omission follows months of criticism from Democrats who accused the Kennedy campaign of indirectly aiding Trump rather than mounting a serious independent challenge. During the interview on Impact Theory with Tom Bilyeu, Shanahan didn't hold back her frustrations with the Democratic Party, accusing them of trying to sabotage their campaign. She reflected on her past support for the Democrats as one of her, quote, biggest mistakes and acknowledged that their campaign's prospects are dimming. In the same breath, she questioned whether Trump could be trusted to uphold his promises if he wins and whether he would continue to include voices like theirs in the conversation. So should Kennedy withdraw and support Donald Trump? You know, this is an interesting position to be in. First of all, um, I don't think he has any other choice. Ever since Ross Perot made an independent run 30 years ago or so in the US, um, the two parties got together and they built not a bipartisan legislation to basically block any independent from really being able to enter the race or any other real party. And the way they did that is they made it impossible to check all the boxes, whether it has to do with delegates or how much money you raise or whatever it is, getting the votes you need. It's basically impossible. So I, I th actually believe that RFK would be the answer for the United States. Knowing how the system works, I would say that he would never have a chance, which is why the Democrats really pushed him out. Um, so from an independence perspective, independent perspective, really not an opportunity. You can get as many votes as you, it's not going to happen. Just the system's built against it. So the next thing that I would say is, why did RFK become an independent? It's because the Democrats were being undemocratic and pushed him out of their party, right? So they passed... Their it's own not like they didn't do that with anyone else, you know, like yeah. Bernie Sanders a couple of years ago. Anybody <laughs> credible or decent, yeah. yeah. Um, and look, I think Bernie's a socialist. Like, I think he would have been a problem, but he was a much better individual than Biden. Anyway, um, the Democrats, so here's how this works, if people don't already know. Inside your party, you can make your own set of rules. So they put in a set of rules that basically said, <clears throat> explicitly, actually, if, if RFK stepped foot, a physical foot, in one of three states, they were all significant swing states. Um, if he stepped foot in those states, all the votes went to Biden. And if he did that, votes from, I believe it was three other states also went to Biden. You go, well, that's, that is insane. But that's their, own, that's their own set of rules inside the Democratic Party. So he looked at this and he went, and he went on social media and goes, look, guys, I got to win 80% of the vote to even win the primary here. I've got no chance. So he had no other option but to say, okay, maybe I'll go libertarian, maybe I'll go independent, because he wasn't going to beat Trump out of the out of the Republican Party. I also think that he he is a neutral person. He is a sort of like, I don't think he'd represent the Republicans very well. Just to be honest with you, like I don't think he'd represent the Democrats very well at this point. He is really that neutral person that I think is important. Now, to the point of him joining Trump, so you do run the risk of having no voice. So if you're gonna throw your support towards Trump, which I think could make a big difference for him right now. Um, it's got to come with some sort of quid pro quo. Me and Shanahan are in here in this capacity. Here's what we get. Here's the positions we get. I, maybe people frown upon that. I think if you don't, you've got no voice. And I do think if RFK sticks around, I think he could still find his way into the presidential seat, maybe in the next term. I think he'd have an opportunity if he stayed in the conversation. So I think that that would be really good for him. Now, the reason I think it's important, um, to sort of join Trump, I guess I would say, I think that Trump is potentially a more potentially a more dangerous individual than Kamala Harris. 
I think Kamala Harris can be controlled by the institution. So I actually think Trump could be a more dangerous individual. That being said, the Democratic Party is a far more dangerous organization than the Republican Party right now, because the Democratic Party has nothing to do with democracy anymore. It has to do with communism, socialism, and losing individual rights and censorship. That's kind of their shtick these days. They're pro-war. They're pro all the things that we, you and I basically don't agree with. So you and I had this conversation before on the podcast. They're driving one way, and that is away from individual freedom, whereas Republicans are driving towards individual freedom and capitalism and non-censorship. They're very, very opposed parties. Now, again, Trump may be a more dangerous individual, but I think we learned something through this last presidential run. The president's not pressing all the buttons, obviously. I mean, Biden can't pull up his own pants. He's not pressing any buttons. So yes, maybe Trump would be more involved than Biden, but at the end of the day, it's the institution and the organization around these people, right? So I think if the Republicans don't win in the United States, just my opinion, and I think if the conservatives don't win in Canada, I think both countries... Um, are in danger of driving themselves off a cliff or, you know, let's stick with our reference today, paddling themselves off the end of the waterfall. That's exactly where I think they're going to go. And one thing I will add to that is what did we see the media machine do to Kamala Harris in the United States? They turned her from the degenerate DEI hire from the Democratic Party that no one wanted to talk to, where 80% of her staff quit because she's untenable to the queen of the Democrats. They did it in four weeks. In some polls, she's doing better than Trump. She's a horrible person, but the reality is that weapon is being used against the people. And I think if he doesn't join forces with Trump, 50-50 that he loses. It is crazy to think that in the Democratic primaries, Kamala got le- like low single digits voters to be three to five Demo- percent, yeah, three to five percent, something like that. Yes, yeah. and then now she's now she's the darling queen, but. When it comes to the staying in the race, uh, because I know that Nicole Shanahan and RFK are pretty much admitting at this point that there's no chance that they can win the actual federal election. But what Shanahan was saying in that interview was that if they got 5% of the national vote, that it would actually allow them to have a, it triggers something in the political system in America where that is now looked at as a viable third party and they would actually be opened up to federal funding and they would have a whole new set of legal standards for the 2028 election. So they were like, if we can just get 5% of the national vote today, that means that we would have a legitimate shot and we wouldn't have to do all this stupid fighting for ballot access, everything that would already be guaranteed if we got 5% of the vote this time. That would be guaranteed to us in 2028. So they're debating whether to play a long game here. Pardon my ignorance. Pardon my ignorance here. When they say that much of the vote, does it have to do with, um, for you to collect that percentage, is it have to do just with volume or does it have to do with 5% of the popular vote? So, oh, oh, that's it. It's just popular vote. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So, no, that's so, great. Thanks. So there is, so there is a potential benefit for them long term on that front. Right. But how old? How old is RFK? RFK is uh, around seventy. So okay, you're looking at yeah, he's uh, bah, bah, bah. yeah, okay, he's seventy on the dot. So you look at that. Okay, are you really going to want to run another campaign in four or five years? Maybe like, one more. Maybe, that's the thing is, if he doesn't so, do it this now, the benefit would be maybe that you have a strong independent party. But if it's built off the back of just RFK, what do you have? Yeah, and then so I I look at this and go. I do genuinely think, I know that you said Trump is maybe a more dangerous individual. I think the DNC at this point is just a massive threat to the Western world. It is. I, I say that I say that not to sound partisan. I say that to be, to, and that's actually how I, I really feel. I do actually think that he could be a more dangerous person. But I say it so I don't sound like I'm playing favorites. I think if the Democratic Party gets voted in, the country falls apart. Like, I'm, I'm there. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm on the same page as you in the sense where there is a massive cult of personality around Donald Trump as much as there's something, you know, Trump derangement syndrome where, yes, people, they, he broke their brains in terms of hating him. I think there's also the equal opposite, which is there's Trump deification syndrome where people yes. think there's literally people in the Bible belt that think he is sent by God to save a Christian America and stuff like this. And so that that is the other side of that insane coin. But so anyways, 
there's enough of a fervent base there that if he wanted to become a dictator, he probably could, and there'd be more than enough people supporting him. I don't, I haven't necessarily seen anything to make me believe that he's actually wanting to become a dictator. I don't, I I think that's poppycock, but, um, nice one, (laughs) (laughs) but hear me out on this. What if Trump, like obviously RFK's main political avenue that he cares a lot about is health and well-being of America, whether it be through the childhood vaccine schedule or whether his long history of environmental legal work. What if Trump said, hey, all right, pull out of the race, come join my administration, and I'm going to put you as the head of the FDA? It's like uh, so RFK, that's what I'm saying. He like, still make a really big difference. Then I he think could actually, if if he if RFK is the head of the FDA, yeah. he could actually be like, okay, I at least this was eighty percent of the issues that I saw with America that I really care about. Yeah, I can at least tackle these head on from here. Well, I think you should look at it like this. You made a good point. He might run one more time if he did, right? But he doesn't really seem like he's in it for himself. That's the kind of guy he strikes. That's why I think he's right for the job. So I think he would be pragmatic enough to go, look, I'm going to run one more time if I do when I'm 74, if I'm in good health and I want to do it. But how much progress am I really going to make? Am I going to get 5% of the vote? Even if I get 10 and the next time I get 20, ooh, still dropping a bucket. It's not enough. It's not enough to get where you need to be. And I think that's the important thing that he's probably going to realize. Why am I doing this? Because I need to fix America. This should be a set. This should be a signpost for Americans to go. This guy was a Democrat got ousted by the Democratic Party. Now he's going, oh my God, I have to support the Republican Party because of how dangerous the Democrats really are. I think he's going to do this. I think he knows that he needs to do this because the Dems get in. America is in a seriously, America's in a precarious situation. They already are, but it gets significantly worse. God, I got to stop using that word. It gets much worse if he does, uh, if he doesn't rather. And like you said, if he can sort of lobby for a position where he has the most influence to do the most good that he wants to, that's job done, man. That's it. Like that's, that's a big win. You know what I mean? And I'll give Trump credit in this. He's enough of a disruptor that he would let him in there and clean house. Yeah. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens there. It would be, it definitely would be interesting. And I think that would probably push the Trump ticket over the top of agree Ken- uh, or of Kamala. And Hey, you know, if RFK is sitting there going, all right, I don't want Kamala to win and I'd like to run again in, in another couple of years. And again, I know that this sounds uh, extreme in a sense, but we've already seen that the Democratic Party is willing to weaponize the justice system in America against political opponents. And so you look at that and you go, okay, let's give Kamala a massive mouthpiece for the American establishment for years who knows how much more entrenched the legal system comes in, in their whole ideological framework and then, you know, just can get weaponized to a greater degree against RFK. And, you know, this is, this is a guy who had his father and his uncle killed by the American the institution unquote, state. Right. So yeah, like <clears throat> he's, ah, Hey, if you're that, if you're that worried about Kamala and the potential future she creates for, America, then maybe that is the best move for Kennedy. Well, then also you you have the opportunity for a 2028 run as a Republican, maybe throw a Tulsi Gabbard in there on your card as your VP. And hey, maybe if 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 you can say, hey, I just went four years into this administration yeah. and look at the work we got done. Exactly. And hey, maybe at that point too, then he, he might not even need a third party and just re- runs as a Republican. At this, at this day and age, the title of Republican and Democrat doesn't mean anything. I, no, I totally like, agree. It's just leader. The, the Democrats are the anti-democratic nominees. It's insane what they've become. Exactly, <laughs> so, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, and then you look at, say, everybody wants a more neutral party. Let's be realistic. Everybody does want yeah. to, like, at scale, 70% of America or more wants a more neutral party. You got 10 to 15% on each side that are just zealots or extremists. But that most people want neutrality. So, hey, maybe he'd be able to bring that. Maybe that'd be a, like a little silver lining, maybe like a long-term plan.
Yep. That might be able to bring something about. All right. Anything else you wanted to add for today? That is everything. All right. Don't forget to head over to our Substack where you can find original articles as well as exclusive podcasts. We are going to record another one here shortly for that Substack where we will go over audience questions about how do we incentivize Canadians to work in agriculture again? How do we promote Canadians having more children? Will anything come of the public health emergency over monkeypox? Who is signing up for MAID and how often are rejections in the program made? So if you want to join us for that, head over to our Substack. You can find the link in the description below. And for those that don't, we'll catch you next time. Bye, everybody.